Hi there. Uh, we're really, really glad that you are listening to this sermon um, and we pray that it will encourage you and that you will grow through it in your faith. Um, we would also like for you to follow along in your Bible because that's how this teaching resource will be most useful to you. Um, this is also not meant to be used on its own. So if you're not regularly meeting with a local church family, we really encourage you to do so. Um, and if you are ever in or near the Lorraine area, we would encourage you to pop in and visit us on a Sunday morning. We'd love to meet you. Um, also, if you would like to support the Lord's work um, in and through the Emmanuel family, um, you can visit emmanuelpe.org slash give. Good morning. Can you hear me? Can you hear? Okay, great. Um, Ephesians 5, um, chapter 5, starting at 21 to 33. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives and husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the saviour of the body. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, if each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. I think that's me. That's not, don't, don't worry. It's, thanks, ma'am. <laughs> right, good morning uh, again. And uh, really, really warm welcome to you. It's great to see some new faces here. Some of you have met. Uh, others not, please, um, if you don't have to, don't rush off. Um, not just me. There's a number of us who would love to meet you and get to know you. Um, and uh, that goes for you guys out there uh, on the live stream as well. Uh, I think many of us here are thankful and glad and excited to be back um, to see one another in person. I certainly uh, um, always prefer preaching to to people. Not that it's uh, about, uh, about me or, or us people by any means. It's about the Lord and His Word. But He has made His Word uh, intelligible and uh, for a clear purpose of, of us understanding it and knowing it, to be shaped by it. Now, uh, if you are new here, first time visiting, or you're joining us online for the first time, or maybe uh, you're listening to uh, this voice recording for the first time, uh, we've taken a two-week break, but we, uh, this is week four of our marriage series. It's the last of our marriage series. We've dived into Ephesians 5, these a few verses starting at verse 21 for a number of weeks. Um, we've looked at the power of marriage. We've had a look at the priority of marriage, that it's one man uh, cleaving to one woman and that they are, are unified, made as one. We've seen how uh, there, there's a, a very intricate relationship, that God has a plan of how marriage uh, is this plan of how the world can see something of what union with Jesus Christ is through our marriages. Um, and we've looked at the purpose uh, of marriage as well. And today, we've kind of, it's not that we've less, left the, the, the best for last, but I, I, when I was busy laying it out, I, I, the thinking was to quite possibly leave the most controversial for last. We're looking at the partners in marriage. In other words, the gender roles uh, in marriage. Now, uh, one of our convictions here at Emmanuel are that we hold to God's word 
and we want to work hard at getting God's Word, but not just knowing it, but understanding it, letting it shape our lives. And so uh, I'm going to ask you to pray uh, with me uh, as we come to His Word and ask Him to do that. Father, we thank You that this is Your Word. We thank You that this is Your eternal Word. Father, and that it's not, not when, when we come to hear from you, it's never some textbook exercise. It's never just something that you have written, that you have breathed out, that you have inspired to just make us feel good about ourselves. But Father, when we come to hear from you, when we come to see just the depth of the gospel in your word, when we come to see Jesus for who he is and what that means for us, Father, we pray that you grow us, that you work through this, your word. Lord, that we don't ever close our Bibles or walk away from our worship services not being challenged or changed by the realities that you bring before us, Lord. And so we ask, as we come to this passage where we look at submission, where we look at headship, all in the context of marriage, Father, will you not only challenge, but Father, grow us for your glory's sake. Build our understanding of the beauties of marriage and how that plays out between husband and wife. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, um, maybe just one more thing to say, if, if this is your first time here, is um, marriage uh, is something that the Bible holds a lot of importance. In fact, the Bible starts with the first marriage, Adam and Eve. We're going to you know, go back to that in a few moments' time. And the Bible ends with a wedding celebration as well. And uh, we feel that marriage is not just the, the reason behind diving in and looking at marriage. It's not just for those who are married today. Whether you've been married for a uh, you know, few months or for 50 years, or, or maybe if you're single today, our understanding of marriage as believers, as Christians, builds our understanding of the gospel and how we relate to the world uh, and so it's for every single one of us, age, you know, no, there, there's no age specific. We want to be teaching our kids, our little ones, about the biblical view and the, and the gift and the importance of marriage. Um, and, and maybe one last thing, just as we, as we get into the passage again, is, is what we must understand, we're going we're gonna to land the plane with this later on, is that you are never, you're never incomplete if you are not married. It is not marriage that completes you. While there is a, a completion element, which we're going to see, is, it's, it's tied up with this intricate beauty of the role of husband and wife. It is Jesus Christ and Christ alone who completes you and I. And we thank Him for that. So let's just kind of set that there. Now, um, this might be a bit challenging to hear, but here's the thing. That you see, there's not a single one of us here who read the Bible perfectly without any influence from any form of, of worldview, be it, be it cultural or experiential. Um, not one of us, there's not one of us who don't read the Bible, and in fact, who don't go through life, who, who aren't processing what we read or hear or experience through some sort of lens, you know, like, like my glasses. We we process things. We, we even read the Bible through, from a point of view that's been developed by our worldview, by experiences, by our culture. We're constantly doing it, every single one of us. Now, it's, it's not all a bad thing, right? In, in terms of, of, you know, let's just use a business or, or work or your job, you know, for example, uh, maybe even just a hobby. Think to yourself how valuable experience is, Right? Um, you know the fact that God has designed us to grow through experience, to evaluate situations. In other words, to learn and, and not to make the same mistake twice. Experience is invaluable. You know, good, good and bad experience. Invaluable as long as we learn from it. It's not a bad thing. But sometimes, and you don't have to be uh, living long or be in relationships long, is, is you'll know that we also react in certain ways because of negative, bad experiences that we've had in the past. We can approach relationships today, even sometimes very subtly and unknowingly, because of abusive or hurtful experiences that we've, we've had in the past, and that can cause us to keep up our guard. Now, all of that, 
all of that plays a role in how we not only read the world and read relationships, but it plays a role in, in how we read the Bible. Now, I'm not just talking about first-hand experience. You know, everything, the families that we grew up, the cultures, you know, the kind of little micro-cultures that we've grown up in, it all plays a role. It plays a massive role in terms of what we easily accept and in terms of the kind of things that when we read in the Bible that might challenge us. We're, we're processing that through the lenses of our cultures. Now, let's do something of a, of a cultural exercise here. I thought Tatiana Schoonmaker's gold medal performance, you know, if you don't know Tatiana Schoonmaker, uh, hopefully majority of our country knows her by now, I thought it was totally awful. I said it, it was awful. <laughs> now the thing is, culturally, when it comes to the English language, See, we've forgotten that the word awful originally meant something of the li along the lines of awe-inspiring. So, so, I mean, don't, don't misunderstand me. I, I, was, I was elated to wake up to the news to see she'd won the gold. Um, but in the modern sense of our, our use of the word awful, we've twisted it around, uh, and it's used completely in the negative sense, when originally, five, six hundred years ago, uh, it was positive. Nowadays, we, we actually, we probably more often use the word awesome in the place of where originally awful would have been used. What would you think of me if, if, you know, if, if you and I, if we were in a kind of casual conversation and I said to you, gosh, I think Pastor Paul's quite cute, eh? <laughs> You'd start wondering, right? Uh, hopefully you start maybe feeling a little bit awkward because you're thinking, yeah, Andre, does Janine know these kinds of things you're saying? <laughs> but I bet you when you heard me say that Pastor Paul was cute, you weren't, you weren't thinking about the word cute, original meaning. See, cute is the shortened version of the word acute, which originally meant to be sharp or witty. brownie points in our ministry meetings there. Okay. The original meaning of cute goes right back to meaning to be sharp or witty. So let's just clarify things because stuff's being recorded here. <laughs> I'm saying I think Pastor Paul is sharp and witty here. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Uh, and you know that it only cha changed in about uh, the 1830s where, where cute began in the English language to take on this meaning to, to mean something, you know, like attractive or pretty or, or, or charming, you know, maybe in the sense of, of children and so forth. But, but the point I'm wanting to make, hopefully you're getting this point, is that when we hear things and when we read things, we're going to process them and we're going to react even according to, to kind of the, the kinds of things that we feel, that we hold to, the norms that we hold to. That you read or hear or even experience something and you process it, through the lens of what you know to be. Now, what's important to understand is when we read this passage, Ephesians 5, 21 down to 33, a passage, hopefully by now, four weeks in, uh, that we know quite well, and we read it through the lens of our current understandings, depending on you know, where you are in terms of culture and, and experience and so forth, often we can find biblical statements challenging because of this. And we need to understand that we've got to then come to the Bible, we've got to come to God's Word to work at understanding the original context, to really dive into, to really dive into being built up and growing through that understanding. Now today, we look at this passage, um, and we look specifically at, at the gender roles, and we read about submission, and we read about headship, and what we have to realize is that we can understand these terms in a way that is far more loaded with present cultural meaning than with the kind of meaning and context that the Apostle Paul was talking about 2,000 years ago. The way the Bible intends or uses those terms. So because of that, just before we jump into what it looks like, you know, what, what the gender roles means for husbands and wives within marriage, is we want to understand specifically how the Bible uses these terms. Now, it's important to understand this. 
This passage is, is written in the context of marriage, the framework of husband and wife, and this is marriage. You see, when we read uh, verse 22, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord, uh, in verse 23, because the husband is the head of the wife, this is not, and this is never, a blanket statement that says that men are superior to women. That's not what Paul is talking about. That's not what he's talking into. Now, here's something that we have to understand. Men and women, women and men, are both image bearers of God. Going right back to Genesis, right back to the very beginning in creation, the very first mention of mankind, man and woman, Genesis 1.27, says God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female image bearers. But it, it's, it's not just a creation statement. But, but get, you know, we've got to get this foundation right. We are both man and woman, boy and girl alike, no matter, you know, tall, fat, short, skinny, skin complexion, background. If you are sitting here today, or listening, following the sermon, you are an image bearer of the living God. Now, it's not just equality in terms of being an image bearer, but this reality of equality does also apply in our marriages as well. So the same Apostle Paul writing to, uh, or in, who's written to the Ephesians here, writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 7, and he writes in the context of, of sex within marriage, uh, and listen to what he, what he says, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 3 and 4. A husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise a wife to her husband. A wife does not have the right over her own body, but a husband does. In the same way, a husband does not have the right over his own body, but his wife does. So, equal image bearers, but also when it comes to marriage, there's also something of equal rights being expressed here. Now, maybe a bit of a side note, but this just explains why the design of marriage just cannot exist, you know, in, in, in the context of polygamy or multiple sexual relationships. You know, the, the equal rights of husband and wife to one another's body just can't be. But friends, if we just hit pause here at this passage in 1 Corinthians 7, which was written to believers 2,000 years ago, living in an ancient Near Eastern kind of oriental society, culture, where women had absolutely no value and no rights, one would understand what Paul is saying to there to be a radically countercultural statement. You see, men would have read the first part, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 3, husband has the right of his wife's body, and, and he would have said, yeah, you know, right, that's me, master of all. But then he would have gotten to the second part, husband doesn't have the right over his own body, wife does, and said, what? Culturally, that wasn't the case. In that Corinthian mixed bag of, of, of cultures at that time. And the shock factor was as much there 2,000 years ago as it might be for many of you today when you read about marital submission and headship. And nowadays even, you know, more and more so in our world, when we read about gender in the Bible. See, that's crucially important to understand. The Bible does not suit one specific worldly culture. It will challenge every single culture and worldview. It's God's eternal word. It's not planted, you know, in kind of 1960s, uh, you know, kind of white picket fence structures of families and that. It's God's eternal word that speaks truth. And friends, that truth works eternally but it's going to challenge it's going to challenge us culturally speaking so even though it might have been a cultural norm for some today it's worth knowing i'm going to say this here it's worth knowing that, that in the no place in the bible does it say that it's the wife's job does it specifically say it's the wife's job to stay at home and look after the kids 
and that the husband is the one who goes out to earn all the money. The Bible doesn't say that. That's cultural. And, and in fact, in the scope of history, it's quite modern. Do you know, before the Industrial Revolution, we go back kind of 300 years or, or so, when most lived in a very rural or, or trade-oriented, you know, agricultural kind of context. Um, wife and husband worked together uh, on the farms or, or in the family businesses, in the trades. They had different roles in that, yes. But they worked together. It wasn't that one kind of, you know, got up and, and went off. That's the, that's the kind of, there's, there's, uh, that's the, the, what we see in, in terms of the Old Testament Israel, that worldview going on there. Um, they work together, farming or in the craft business. It's only in the last two, three hundred years that it's become the norm that one goes off to work. But it's amazing how we so easily just kind of uh, impose that understanding on Genesis 1 and 2, where we're told that the man will toil at work. You know, we think, well, it's the man's role to earn the paycheck. No. In fact, you read Proverbs 31. Hopefully many of the ladies here know Proverbs 31 well. It's this great picture. This picture of this godly, faithful, capable uh, woman and wife. Uh, but what Proverbs 31 is, it tells us that she's industrious. Uh, in fact, that she handles the family's investments. Uh, investments. You know, she, she invests in real estate. She's, she's industrious, you know, she's, she's making and producing while being faithful to her husband. The Bible never says in, in very kind of detailed context, and we're going to get to what it does say, but it never says this is the man's job, you know. He will go off. He will run the checkbook. Not that that term's really applicable nowadays, but, you know, he will have the internet banking passwords, and she will, she will order from checkers online. <laughs> Doesn't say that. Friends, if we are, <laughs> we've got to be careful that we don't read our culture in here. Now, we come back to Ephesians 5, because that is where we are. Is when we read Ephesians 5, we read about submission and headship, wives and husbands, this does bring us to a question. If we are equally image bearers, then why? Why does Paul say wives submit and husbands lead? If we have equal rights and we're equally image bearers, why is there a, a focus on gender roles? Yeah. Does it mean that the wife always just submits and doesn't play any role in her husband's sanctification? Or that the husband uh, only is, is the only one that loves? Because that's what, you know, they, those are kind of the instructions. And that the wife never does that. No. You know, we know from the greatest scope of the Bible and even from the context of this passage and what Paul said beforehand and afterwards that those are realities, sanctification and self-sacrificial service and submission to one another as we submit to the Lord. Those are realities for every single believer and we looked at that a few weeks ago. But this leads us to have to ask, why then does Paul describe these roles in that way? And so the answer lies in our first point today that while we are created equally, there are profound differences between men and women. Here, there are profound dif differences between husbands and wives. Uh, why are these two areas of submission for wives and, and headship for, for husbands emphasized? Well, because men and women are different. There are differences that no matter how alternative the world might be right now, and it, man, it is changing and you know, morphing at a rapid rate in terms of its view of sexuality and gender. But there are differences that one just can't get away from, that one can't deny. Now, the obvious is, you know, the, the, the kind of biology, uh, gender, physical gender biology, the fact that, that, you know, that one's born with sexual organs. Now, the progressive secular world, say, you know, very easy, just disregards that. But, but it's not just, you know, it's not just physical. Developmentally, uh, we see it. You know, there's a few teachers in our midst here today and uh, you know, a few doctors and that. You, you know, we'll know this. It's proven that girls mature and develop earlier than boys. But not just in the way of growth. Do you know that babies, baby boys and, and baby girls, they react differently to, to similar stimulation? 
Clinical research has confirmed that baby girls generally will be more advanced than baby boys when it comes to using fine motor skills. Okay? But do you know that baby boys prefer mechanical motion over human motion? There's, there's just something about them that mechanical motion, you know, playing with toys or, or something zooming by, it, it, it just catches their interest more than, than, than human motion. You know, I think it was in about the 90s or so, a little study was done. Uh, they played jazz, smooth jazz uh, music to, to two groups, baby boys, baby girls. Um, the baby girls' heart rates picked up when they heard the music, and, and you could see they, apparently, they, they started kind of showing some. The boys? Nada. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it was, you know, smooth jazz, whatever. They, they need to be captured in that. Came across an article written by Dr. Anita Seti. Now she's a secular post-feminist psychologist, American, who specializes in early childhood education. And she wrote this uh, a CNN article. She writes in an article that when her first child was born, she had a son, um, and then later she had a daughter. She explicitly made sure that those kids, those babies, never had access to gender stereotypical toys. Uh, and colors and norms, you, you know, so she made sure the boy didn't have a blue bedroom and the girl had a pink bedroom and, you know, she didn't automatically go and buy toys, uh, uh, cars for the boys and Barbies for the girls and, and so forth. But she writes that when her daughter came along, even though she had decided that, that it, would, it wouldn't be the case, she writes that there were differences between boy and girl that could only relate to gender. Now, it's not just a childhood reality. It's not even just something taught in the Bible. Do you know that it's a, an economic reality as well? Maybe you've done the exercise, but do you know that the insurance industry recognizes a significant difference between men and women? Why? Because men and women react differently, you know, most notably behind the, the car steering wheel. Uh, and from a risk point of view, there's a difference. But ladies, don't start the, diggle, the giggle. You know, guys, we might give our wives a hard time about their driving ability, but you know that women drivers are considered to be less risky than, than we are. Now, don't shoot the messenger here, <laughs> but, but the numbers show it. You, you see it in the premium, uh, your premiums. In fact, your wife, just because she's a lady, if she's noted as a driver of, of, a, of a car or a vehicle, well, she's saving you money. Now, there's brownie points for, for Andre and the, and the ladies there. Okay, it's, it's not just biblical. There are differences that we just can't deny. You know, and this speaks into the reality of the world that we're possibly kind of changing into today. Now, a major difference a major difference that's written about men and women in secular research, no matter where they might be on the spectrum, you know, kind of approaching biblical worldview, is that as men develop, they, they move, they develop, they grow towards autonomy, and as women develop, they grow towards seeking community. So as men, in other words, we grow towards seeking to do it on our own, you know, standing on our own two feet. But as women develop, they move towards community or togetherness. Now, this is a generalization. You know, it's not every single man and woman. You know, I think you could have just looked at the bathroom debate, and that would have settled it. Men go on their own. Seemingly, ladies don't. But, friends, when Paul says... Husbands, lead self-sacrificially and wives submit out of your reverence for Christ. He's telling us to do that speaking into this reality. That we are different. That husbands, husbands, husbands post the fall, after Genesis 3, we will generally move to look after our in own interests first. And that wives will naturally gravitate towards community using all the resources they have. Now we want, we're going to ask why, so that's our second point today. Because of 
the foundational differences that we've seen right at the beginning. We go right back to the beginning, to the creation account, and to the order that God made man and woman in. It's described in Genesis 2, verse 18 and, and onwards. God saw man. He created the first man. He looked at him and he said, you need a helper. And then woman, while being an image bearer, was formed from man. And Adam, man, named her. And here again, you know, while we work, it, work out our understanding headship and submission, let's, let's, let's be careful about working at these words. Tim Keller mentioned him a few times in this marriage series. He helpfully describes the fact that it's important to understand the root usage of the words we read. Headship, in actual fact, if you go back to original languages, headship has its roots not in, not in the, the head of the body as such, even though Paul uses that illustration in the New Testament. Headship has, it, has its roots in, in how you understand the headship of rivers or waters as such. In other words, headship, the context of headship is used in how it relates to the source. God gave the first husband headship because woman came from that husband because of that closeness to the source. But it doesn't stop there. God also gave the first husband, Adam, authorship. Now, we, we hear the word authority today, like with submission. We hear authority, and generally, unless you're the person in authority, right, it's a challenging word. It's got a negative context. Uh, I think our, our own politics in our own country, you know, is, is just really, and it's, it's not, not something that's unique to South Africa by any means. Have a look at how the you know, police are being defunded all over the world and, uh, and how, how you know, parents are, are losing authority over their own children. And We live in an anti-authoritarian society. But where does the word authority actually come from? Well, the root of that word comes from the word author. The one who designed it. The one who spoke it into being. Might be... And so when God said, name, you know, the, the animals and the birds of the sky and the fish in the sea, he gave that task to Adam. He was giving him authority over that. But when Adam named his wife, not, not, you know, not Eve, but woman, he was given authority over woman. Now, what we've got to remember now, you, you know, I know that's kind of, we're going to leave that there just for a few minutes is that in the reality being expressed when God looked at Adam and said you need a helper is that it means that there were some things that Adam on his own couldn't do so again we see that the creation account is just speaking to this reality of differences between man and woman man on his own needed that helper to complete him to be able to do the task. My friends, again, helper, not used in a derogatory or, or, or substandard kind of term. The Bible do doesn't ever use it in that way. In fact, uh, helper is used to refer to God himself. Psalm 46, God is my strength and shield, my helper. Maybe the most important reference to God as the helper is how Jesus refers to to the person and work of the Holy Spirit. He's the counselor, the helper. It's a sophisticated term, helper, that describes how one uses their power to enable one another. See, helper? It's not derogatory. It's not that kind of saying, oh, you, you know, like, like I might do with my daughters, you know, I don't want Maddie to work with the power tools, so even though she wants to kind of help me with things around the house, I'll say, well, you know, I don't say that, but you could say, you know, your daddy's little helper, and she, she will just kind of hand on the tools and that, but ultimately, I'm saying you're the little helper because I'm the one who's going to do it all. That's how we might see it, but that's not what the Bible is saying when God gave Adam a helper. There is tremendous power in being a helper. It's a sophisticated term. 
And it takes humility. And it takes faith. In fact, biblically, it's not something that's ever tied up with weakness. But to be a helper is a humble expression of power that leads to completion. I'll say that again. To be a helper is an exercise of humble expression that leads to completion. And there's a profound natural beauty in that. So when Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands, and he's appealing to that natural creation order, that plan that God used uh, and set in motion right at the very beginning. He's, you know, he's not downgrading women. He's not downgrading the role of the wife by any means, but he's referring to a tremendous beauty. Now, I'd like to say more about this, but you know, time is, is, is catching us, and it's already a little bit longer than normal. But, but that's, that's a natural creation reality. But what we also have to remember, if we've started in Genesis 1, and uh, we've looked at how God has fleshed it out a little bit more in Genesis 2, is that Genesis 3 came along. So that was God's good design for marriage. Headship of the husband helper of the wife but friends in our fallenness because of the curse of sin on this world there is something that's gonna that, that, that is broken in that regard mankind will struggle at work and the effect of the fall god tells eve that the woman will desire her husband now he's not talking about affectionate desire here again getting that word right he's talking about in maybe in one way to say it is to desire the role of a husband it's got a very negative connotation here and then he says that the husband will rule over the wife referring to a domineering kind of autocratic way uh, and as we know and, and you know if we are, are deep down honest with ourselves those of us who are married and you might have been married for some time we know that as men what do we do we so easy make it about ourselves and we abdicate. And as women, for some very capable women, we just very naturally and easy step into the vacuum. You know, step into the role that God had created for the husband. So when Paul says in Ephesians 5, wives submit. It's not that negative modern-day understanding that understands submission as weakness. But it's a call to step into an expression of power that's most natural at its core. And in the same instance, when he calls husbands to lead, or for us as men, guys, it's actually a call to man up, you know, to step into that role which is difficult. And hard and costly. That's the kind of leadership that we see here. Lead as Christ loved the church. How did Jesus Christ love the church? Well, he didn't look on and say, well, my bride is perfect and spotless and blameless. He looked on at the misery and ugliness of the world, the sin of you and I, and he didn't say conditionally, I will do this. But it cost him everything. So that he could go to the cross, that he could pay for our sin. And so that he could sanctify us, that he could make us holy and blameless in the sight of God. Friends, there's power in biblical submission within this context. But there's tremendous power and humility in what it is to lead in the kind of way as husbands that God calls us to lead. Last week, uh, I shared a little bit, uh, something about our time in Cape Town when we went down to, to study at George Whitfield College. Um, and uh, leading up, it was a very short lead up. We, we made the call on, I think it was the 18th of December, to go study, you know, to start in January, to be in Cape Town through a number of confirmations of some of the ministers here and the guys I looked up to. Um, and maybe you know this or not, but when it came to making that decision, you know, to pack everything up here in PE, we'd just moved back into PE, in fact, 
pack family and house up and move to Cape Town for three years. Um, when the opportunity and encouragement came from others to go do that, and you know, some funding thankfully was, was secured, um, I was struggling with the whole idea of, of doing this. I, I did not want to go. Okay, if you know me, you will know that my first six or eight months at George Whitfield College, Bible College, was spent kicking and screaming <laughs> trying to, to, to get back here. I didn't finish like that, by, by the way. But I was struggling with the whole idea of, of, you know, of packing up this family. And, and I said to Janine, my wife, well, if you're happy, Janine, if, if you're happy moving, then we'll go. You know, my wise wife said to me, if you know Janine, you shouldn't be surprised by this. You're not going to put this on me. And here's what she said to me. You're not going to put this on me. Andre, you make the decision. Now, up until that point, I always thought that, that putting her needs above my own and the needs of my family meant just giving, you know, kind of handing over, giving the decisions to make. But in actual fact, what I was doing there, I was abdicating. And I was placing a kind of pressure on Janine, my wife, that she wasn't created to bear. See, I was not only stepping back, but I was stepping out of this kind of created beauty, which, which, you know, as we finish off to see today, is a mystery which is still being expressed and still being played out and still learned within, within the context of our marriage, of what it is to be a husband leader and a, you know, and a wife who's submitting. You see, it took humility and grace and tremendous power on Janine's side and it took, took strength and courage on my side to step up. And friends, I'm not saying that I've got it right ever since then. But the reality is, what we've seen and what we've experienced is that it works. See, truth works. Though the world might say it today, there's no such thing as alternative truth, alternate truth. Truth works. And we have been made, we've been created according to the truths that we see being expressed here today within the context of marriage. So, like I said, time's catching us. If that's what it means, then practically, how do we express this in our marriages? So the third point, and we're going to get practical here, the third point is that we embrace this biblical worldview and that we not just accept our cultural views. So what does it look like? Well, hopefully I made it clear, not some blanket statement that says that husbands are the sole breadwinners and, you know, we think of all the norms that we see and, and might have grown up in. It never means that husbands demand what we get. It never means that the wife uh, is the walkover. It doesn't mean that. And I want to be clear on that. You see, this framework of what we're given in the Bible, it's never oppressive. Male headship or, or, or husband leadership uh, is not oppressive. What Paul describes here is that a husband, in fact, can't demand headship, but that he can only give it. But we know the reality is after the fall, like I said, we step back from it. Friends, what it also means, and I know it's a joke today, you know, you know, I'm not saying don't tell the jokes and so forth, but what it also means is that even though wives, and there are many women who I know here who are capable, are incredibly capable, but a wife is never just that neck that manipulates and turns the head as the husband, you know, as we kind of flippantly joke and say. So like I said, let's get practical. Now, I found these points from Tim and Kathy Keller helpful in terms of really kind of jotting down what it, what it looks like in terms of living to this reality. And so I'm going to ask um, Elton just to chuck those points up as I go through them. But firstly, what it means is that the husband's authority, like Jesus, over us, is never used to please himself, but only to serve the interests of his wife and ultimately his family. See, Jesus didn't come to please himself. Yes, his glory is tied up in, in all of it. But he came to serve. 
That's where true biblical authority lies. The husband's authority is never used to please himself, but to serve his wife. But secondly, and this is where so much injustice and hurt and abuse has taken place, a wife is never to be merely compliant, but is to use her resources to empower. In other words, what I mean by that is a wife is to be her husband's most trusted friend. We looked at that a few weeks ago. To be your husband's most trusted friend and vice versa. In other words, uh, as husbands and wives, we, we need to hear one another. Because completion is hard work. To be able to, to, to serve one another's needs and interests, we need to understand them. Get to the heart of them and know them. But a wife is never just a walker. She's never just merely compliant. But she uses all she knows. She uses all her resources to empower. And friends, there's power in that, as we said. Now thirdly, what this means, and I said, I said this just now, this doesn't mean a wife gives her husband unconditional obedience. And I want to explain that. See, in Acts 5, verse 29, Apostle Peter said, that we obey God rather than man. And so what this means is that a wife's submission is never to be used to empower her husband to sin. The husband is abusing his wife physically. It's not that that's the only form, the most tragic form of abuse. But if a husband is abusing his wife physically, it's going to take tremendous strength for her to love and forgive him, but at the very same time to call the cops and to have him arrested. Okay. This doesn't mean a wife is just a doormat to be walked over. Fourthly, assuming the role of headship is only done for the purpose of ministering to your wife and family. So men, husbands, Assuming the role of headship is only done for the purpose of ministering to our wives and to our families. See, it's the hardest part, but headship is never used selfishly. See, the reality of, of, of marriage, and we looked at this as the priority of marriage, you know, husband cleaving to wife, that you leave your father and mother, you leave everything else behind. In other words, you two have the primary say. The reality of that is that there's only two votes, right? So at times, there's going to be a stalemate. And so what this means, what Paul is saying, is that the, the tiebreaker, the deal breaker of that vote, does lie with the husband. But the emphasis of that decision is there solely, solely for the purpose of ministering to his wife and to his family. That's the framework that this male headship, that this leadership is given so friends, those are practical, those are fairly general, but hopefully it helps a little bit in applying that to yourselves. I just want to finish here. Ephesians 5 verse 32, after Paul gave this instruction to husbands and wives, after he painted the picture of the beauty of marriage, he said this, this mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. I want to remind you, yes, there is a, a role of completion that is given in the purpose of marriage. But friends, marriage is a gift given to us to point us towards that true completion and unity that we find in Jesus Christ, that gift given to us through the gospel. So if you're sitting here today, if you're sitting here today and you feel, well, I'm not that man, you know, I can't, I can't be that kind of husband. I've messed up so many times in the past. I'm not telling you to man up. But you see, God's word calls us to look to Jesus Christ, the husband, the most masculine man who has ever lived, who gave more than we could ever give and trust that he has given us grace to step into that role that he has created us to. He 
you're a wife sitting here today, and I know it's easier for me to identify with the husbands, but if you're a lady, if you're a wife sitting here today, and you feel the struggle, you feel that, you know, this is something massive. How, how, how do I submit? My friends, you look to Jesus Christ. He has the Son, looked at the cross, knew what he was going to endure for the world, went because it was his Father's will. And because he's done that, he has given you grace. He's given you grace to live in ways that we might, on our own, feel weak for. But we look to the cross. This mystery is profound. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. Let's pray. My Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, just for the beauty of marriage. Father, and I thank you that when, when you, just something that we've seen here today, when you look in on us as men and women, and for those of us who are married as husbands, as wives, and for those who, who uh, might be looking forward towards marriage, Lord, I thank you that we get an, an assurance in knowing that nothing is an accident. But Lord, that you are always using that. You are using our relationships to show the world the glory of Jesus Christ. You are using our relationships between husbands and wives to sanctify one another, to make each other more Christ-likeness. Lord, I thank you for the assurance of knowing that even in those difficult days, those times where I mess up as a husband, where I abdicate, where I put selfishness above the needs of my family, Lord, I thank you that I have been reminded over and over again, that you have stepped into that place as the perfect husband. And that you use those mess-ups. You use that ugliness. You use that shortfall. You ultimately even use that sin to grow us more and more, not only in our dependence on you, but in Christ-likeness in you and through you. And so, Father, I pray for us as a church. I pray for our understanding of marriage. Lord, when we close our Bibles, when we close our notebooks and leave today or stop this live stream, Father, that we don't just shut it off there. But, Lord, you continue to grow us as husbands, as men who stand up and lead, not, not the way the world defines it, but who self-sacrificially give. And as wives who speak of the glory of the Son that submitted to the will of the Father and care that takes humility and strength, Father. Lord, the witness of that to, to, to friends and family around, to children growing up in those households. Father, will you continue to equip us to live for your glory's sake in that way? We pray this in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen.